Okay. Uh, I realized I'm the last talk between you and the World Cup, so I'll try to stay in time. And I made this little title to uh, kind of tr give tribute to the epigenetics and World, World Cup. Okay, so um, we, we know that um, chip chip and chip seq has been widely used to detect uh, in vivo uh, protein DNA interactions at genome scale, but there are a number of challenges that somehow prevented chip seq to be widely adopted to generate uh, data of every sort of every factor. Um, these include, uh, first actually in order to do a chip, you have to know in a cell condition which factors are interesting and worth chipping. And second, the factor you're interested in must have a very good quality antibody. And third, even if you have both the first two, uh, if there are one cell condition you're interested in and there are multiple factors that are interesting, you have to chip them one at a time. So we want to kind of overcome these difficulties by using epigenetics to infer transcription regulation. So we know that in the cell, um, DNA is not naked. Instead, it's packaged in these nucleosomes, um, which consist of eight histone proteins plus uh, around 147 bases of DNA wrapped around it. And so nucleosome positioning actually um, some repels transcription factor some transcription factors actually can only uh, come to these nucleosome free regions and cannot bind to the DNA that are wrapped around nucleosomes. In addition, um, these have tails which can be epigenetically marked. Some marks attract transcription factor binding, while others would repel transcription factor binding. And so, um, um, in, in the past, people have tried to do histomark chip seq at nucleosome resolution, which is uh, we have the nuclear, uh, the chromatin here, and we can digest the chromatin with the cochlear nucleus enzyme to release all the mononucleus. And if um, we are interested in specific type of histone modification, we can use the antibody to pull down uh, specifically modified uh, nucleosomes, and then sequence the nucleosomal DNA that wraps around these histones. And so this has been done in a very systematic way in Ke Zhao's group. Later on, the analysis was not really done at nucleosome resolution. So we needed to look at the data in nucleosome re resolution. So if you look at the original data here, each of each uh, region represents uh, one kind of histone modification. And originally, it doesn't matter what kind of modification we have, have to represent a sequence, the nucleosome. And so for each nucleosome, we see only reached either the head or the end of that nucleosome. So if we have seven, six spaces, we can reach the total uh, nucleosome. And then um, if we uh, look at the cover position just to see how many tags landed there, we can get a little profile. Of course, actually, when you sequence these uh, modified nucleosomes, you don't exactly 146 spaces of nucleosome. Sometimes the nucleosome is around 146 and sometimes it's shorter. So in order to get the new, we only look at the middle 73 bases, and then that usually gives us profile. If we compare the original data, which is can transform the data, give us very, very clean position nucleosome. We have three position nucleosomes and um, uh, nucleosome linker regions. Of course, this doesn't really give us genome why? Because we are only able to sequence nucleosomes that are epigenetically marked. Probably the most informative nucleosomes in the genome. It's the one that carries some histone marks. So um, using this method is actually cost effective. We only need to sequence about three to five percent in the genome, and they are all at the functional elements, and that tells us where the positioning looks like at that location. We started looking more on uh, how the nucleosome positioning can help us understand transcription regulation. Um, if you talk to a yeast transcription re regulation scientist, most of them think that transcription factors are the main actors, and histone marks is just a shadow that's left behind by the transcription factors. Uh, however, this, this kind of uh, interpretation has been challenged lately in vertebrate. For example, in a collaboration study that we have done in zebrafish, where we look at uh, zebrafish histone modification patterns in the very early embryonic development. 
Um, so we know that a lot of people are doing histone modification studies uh, on embryonic stem cells in human mouse, but most of these stem cells are already cultured in a petri dish. Zebrafish embryo, you can really get a good real embryo because um, you put the male and female in a separate tank at night, and then at light time you put them together and they will start mate and uh, you can collect the fertilized eggs and they can mate every day and give you thousands of eggs every day. So you can really do genomic experiment on a live embryo. So before 1,000 cells, uh, zebrafish will just, uh, sorry, the embryo will just divide. There's no transcription, no histone modification. We have background. And it start around uh, 1,000 cells, the zygotic genome start transcribing so we can see which happens first, you know, which kind of mark happens first, is CO2 coming first or histone mark coming first. Interestingly, what we found is that uh, there are a class, a whole class of genes that could be um, marked by H3K4 trimethylation at the gene beginning. There is no K36 trimethylation which um, represent CO2 elongation. There's no CO2 binding at all. And there is no K27 trimethylation repressing the gene expression. So these locations are already marked before PO2 is there, before the gene is on. So it seems like sometimes the epigenetic not just tell us a, a kind of a shadow of the transcription factor. It seems like uh, it can reflect what's going to happen, what's the potential of things that are going to happen. And so this is um, the, the, the phenomenon we observe in some vertebrate promoter sequences. And uh, we, we also think maybe in the enhancers there are also dominance like this. So we started looking at H3K4 uh, isolation. Um, you're probably all aware of Bing Ren's uh, histone uh, code idea where um, he proposed that K4 trimethylation is mostly going to the promoters. So in the very, and, and then um, H3K4 monomethylation are mostly going to the Sorry, K4 trimethylation are going to the promoters and monomethylations are mostly going to the enhancers. So in the um, beginning, we actually tried uh, all of the three marks, mono, di, and trimethylation. And we used three um, different data sets to help us calibrate um, the performance. We use all the RefSeq promoters to give us the promoter annotation, and we use uh, two chip, chip data, sites, uh, data sets to tell us the coverage on the enhancers. And interestingly, when we sequence about similar number of tags, H3K4 trimethylation are indeed mostly going to the promoters. And um, um, in H3K4 monomethylation, indeed all the hits are mostly going to the enhancers. However, with H3K4 dimethylation here, um, probably the antibody is really, really efficient. It actually can enrich promoters as good as trimethylation, and it can enrich for enhancers much, much better than monomethylation. And um, indeed, if we sequence about 50 million tags, we can reach saturation and pretty much get most of the uh, active promoters in the cell and most of the transcription, functional transcription factor binding sites. You can see here, we can probably get like 70 to 80 percent of all the binding sites one histone mark experiment. And 15 million tags now with uh, CA2X sequencing is just one lane of sequence. And so basically from a single lane of sequencing, we can hit most of all the active description factor binding sites. When we look at specific AR binding site, we notice a phenomenon that's interesting. So androgen receptor is a transcription factor that is normally in the cytoplasm. Upon uh, binding to androgen hormone, it will be activated and go into the nucleus and start transcriptional, pro, uh, transcriptional activity. And so if we look at the AR chip chip, these are a after AR activation. So AR chip chip are mostly in the middle regions here. Before AR activation, a lot of the locations are already marked with H3K4 dimethylation. And you would see some fuzzily positioned nucleosomes. But after uh, AR activation, this is up on the hormone treatment, we, we would see that AR would bind in the middle locations. And the two nearby nucleosomes will be much better positions and the, uh, positioned, and the middle nucleosome will be much, much weaker. And so um, we validated this observation using qPCR on both the kind of isolation marked nucleosome as well as all the nu nucleosome in, in the gene, like uh, the overall nucleosome density. And we observed that in each of the cases, in the two nearby nucleosomes increase and the middle nucleosome go down. And the trend is similar 
um, if you look at the mark nucleosomes or if you just look at overall nucleosome density. And so we have a model um, that works like this. In some cell conditions, even though the transcription factor that can come here are not here yet, the location where it combines somehow are already marked, probably due to like very low level promiscuous transcription or something. And then upon the stimulus, when majority of this transcription factor is coming to the, to the site, it will displace the middle nucleosome and the two nearby nucleosome will be much, much better positioned and their histone marks will increase. And this will tell us a transcription factor is coming and when we see an opposite effect from this to that, we will know that a transcription factor is leaving its location. And so we could specifically look for patterns like this between two nearby conditions um, and look at how much the middle nucleosome is decreasing and how much the two flanking nucleosome is increasing. And we can design a nucleosome stabilization, destabilization score to kind of rank all the regions and tell us whether the transcription factor is, is coming in this case or in this case, uh, sorry, in this case is coming and in, in the back, uh, this case is leaving. And um, we know that in a regular condition, there are probably hundreds of thousands of regions that are marked by H3K4 dimethylation. But when you compare two conditions upon a stimulus, the transcription factor that come or go in response to the stimulus is probably only limited, probably a five or 10 of them that are really, really the drivers of, of the stimulus response. And so we could take these um, high score nucleosome dynamic locations and just use the enhancer regions. Um, so here we use H3K4 dimethylation signal higher than trimethylation as a criteria to, to call enhancers. And then we can use motif analysis to try to find a motif in the middle um, that can tell us what is the driving regulators here. Um, so for example, if we take a, uh, all the nucleosome dynamic regions here, um, we retrieve the 1KB sequence um, remove the two nucleosomal DNA, look for a motif that are enriched in here relative to the flanking region. So we cannot use the nearby location as the background and want to make sure to find a motif that's enriched here relative to the flanking regions. That can help us identify the driving transcription factors or regulators that are uh, coming to bind in response to the stimu stimulus. And so when we try this in antigen response um, at 16 hours uh, versus four hours, we could use to identify novel transcription factors that are coming to bind uh, in, in response to the stimulus that we can validate later on. Uh, especially interesting is for example, this OX1 uh, binding location. You can see um, at the zero hour when AR is not activated, we see two well-positioned nucleosome and a nucleosome-free region here. And from CHIP, we know that OX1 is bind there very strongly. At four hours, uh, we see three fuzzily positioned nucleosome. And in this case, actually, OX4 is starting to leave a lot of sites and then uh, a, a lot of uh, cells. And then at 16 hours, uh, OX1 is coming back to the location again and we see again two well-positioned nucleosome with a nucleosome-free locations in the middle. So we can totally use the nucleosome dynamics to tell us the actual transcription factor coming and leaving. Um, after this uh, pilot study, we started to apply this in a, a, a more uh, interesting problem where the driving factors are not known. In this we are looking at the uh, intestine cell differentiation. Uh, here we are looking at the small intestine. So food is on the top, the villus is these are mostly differentiated cells. And the bottom here are the crypts and include most of the progenitor and stem cell-like uh, cells. And so the question is difference between the stem cell and, and the differentiated cell. Um, our collaborator actually has both a human in vitro system. We can promote the cell to differentiate upon some outside uh, culture or they can just directly look at the mouse embryo. You take out the mouse uh, uh, intestine and you can shake them loose and you can collect the, the, the top portion of the villus versus the bottom version of the crypts and then you can do histomatic profiles. So here we actually tried both K4 dimethylation and K20 cetylation and um, the results are actually similar. So um, with looking at the nucleosome dynamics, we see many K like this, in the progenitor cells, you see two strongly positioned nucleosome 
with, with the middle nucleus on free region, whereas in a differentiated uh, condition, this position is occupied by the nucleosome. And from here, we can identify motifs such as Gata and Bach. Um, in, other, in the other situation, we see two strongly positioned nucleosomes in a differentiated stage, whereas in the progenitor cell, it's three kind of weakly positioned nucleosomes. And in here, we also find a, a lot of strong motifs. And uh, one thing that is kind of caught our attention is this CDX2 factor, because people know that CDX2 is important for gut. However, in terms of gene expression, actually CDX2 is similar in the progenitor and differentiated cells. It's probably only slightly higher expressed in the differentiated cells. In terms of the binding, it to be binding much, much stronger in the differentiated cells than the progenitor cells. So that um, uh, got our collaborators to be interested in looking at CDX2 binding in the two uh, cell types. And indeed, uh, CDX2 bind much stronger in many, many more sites in the differentiated cells, and that's actually correlated with our nucleosome dynamics um, prediction. So we started looking at, you know, what's the difference that caused a transcription factor to go to so many places, and we, we started the other factors that are also enriched in these conditions and see co-localized with the uh, CDX2 binding. And what we found is that, um, in progenitor cells, CDX2 are very often six, and in the differentiated cell, CDX2 is also coloration at four. So the collaborator helps stabilize where it could go to, even though the expression level for, for CDX2 is very uh, not that big a difference. So these two transcription factors actually have cell type specific transcription pattern. So our collaborators um, also. DNA6 and HNF4 chip seek in, the, in both conditions. And what we found is in the progenitor cells, um, CDX2 is mostly co localized with 6, and in the differentiated cells, uh, CDX2 is mostly co localized with HNF4. And actually, both the GATA6 and HNF4 bind directly predicted from the H3K4 dimethylation dynamics using the nucleosome uh, dynamic score. And um, if we look at at uh, uh, nucleosome dynamic locations, and we look at their gene expression here, we find that um, in most of the uh, 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 differentiated nearby genes are, are, are usually um, linked with um, metabolism, digestion, you know, it's like really related to gut function. In the progenitor cells, it's mostly related to embryonic development, placenta, or uh, organ development. So everything seems to make sense. And uh, later, our collaborator actually used a conditional knockout to kind of knock, knock out the CDX2 in the mouse. And indeed, you see the control. This is kind of a small intestine forming correctly, whereas in the knockout, the small intestine is just not working very well. And interestingly, in the wild type, this middle nucleosome, even in a, in a mouse uh, in vivo system, we can see these locations with CDX2 binding have very low nucleosome occupancy in the middle nucleosome. But after uh, knockout, these three locations, the nucleosomes are coming back. So um, in, in summary, we think that resolution A3K4 dimethylation chip seek is a very costly way to investigate nucleosome dynamics at the cis regulatory sequences. So from a single experiment, we can identify tens of thousands of active promoters and enhancers. We can use it to investigate multiple transcription factors in one chip seek experiment. And the study is actually not limited to antibody availability. In this study, we did use uh, chip seek to validate our prediction. But in, in cases where there's absolutely no antibody, you can just knock down the factor of interest. And if the downstream gene expression change in the right direction, you will know that the prediction is correct. Um, and we can actually use the, this method to discover novel driving transcription factors in a biological process. And uh, right now we are trying uh, some situation where one progenitor cell can be differentiated into several different lineages and using a time course histomark uh, chip seek experiment, trying to figure out in each pathway what are the drivers. And of course this requires very close interaction between the experimental and the computational biologist. So I would like to thank the postdoc in my lab. Um, Hansen is actually co-supervised by
me, Miles Brown, uh, he did all the ChIP-seq experiments. Cliff out the computational algorithm, and uh, G is the postdoc who is collaborating with uh, Ramesh Shiv Dasani's lab um, on the gut development, and Mike Verzi is out uh, doing the gut development experiments. Okay, and here. We have time for a couple of, set of questions. So please step up to the mic. Right, so I guess there hasn't been an, oh, one good, one great. Nice. Very nice talk. Do you have any uh, worries that maybe there are certain classes of transcription factors that don't work through k, k methylation? It's definitely possible. You know, I, actually, um, there is a recent uh, genome research paper from the British Columbia Genome k uh, Agency looking at, uh, for example, FOXA2 binding. Ask how come some of them are nucleosome free in the middle, and some of are binding to nucleosomal DNA, and there are also FOXA1 that's binding, but there is no mark at all. And their overall conclusion there is, in general, the dynamic, like the nucleosome-free binding, seem to be a lot more function, no histomark or, or occupy the nucleosome. And uh, it's very likely that a portion of the transcription factors don't mind whether region is nucleosome-free or not. And I think with more data, that will allow us to so what's the difference? Does that mean some transcription factors can respond faster than others? There's no chromatin required, but at least this as a screen mechanism can already give us a lot of useful information to kind of figure some kind of a, I would think, transcription network now, because you can really get transcription factors and a lot of their genome-wide binding sites in a single event. Very nice. Thank you. Um, and always. I liked your intuition about how by Checking out the nucleosomes that you can position based on those modifications, you're in fact looking at the interesting one. To try to quantify this based on independent nucleosome positioning data or actually looking at different marks to basically see what their relative power is. So I only showed K4 monodyne trimethylation. We also showed 27 is pretty good. I think K4, uh, K9 acetylation is also good. I think K4 monomethylation antibody is just, it's really specific to but it's not specific in terms of pulling down the right thing. You have to sequence a lot of to sequence enough of that. What about um, repressive marks, for example? Uh, repressive are usually not as enriched in enhancers. Another mark I think would be very useful H2AZ. That's um, interestingly what we found is that, um, um, for example, in this situation, um, description factor is binding in this location. Uh, the middle nucleosome has much higher uh, H2AZ mark than the two flanking nucleosomes. And that probably made this nu middle nucleosome very, very fragile or very, uh, yeah, dynamic. And so that's also an informative histomark. We, we probably in this study uh, initially tried 10 different histomarks, and at least for enhancers, we found K4 to be the cleanest and the easiest to work with. One last question. Hi. Maybe your NSD score is meaningfully in that you check the nucleus in the middle, but in the next stage, the nucleus just go out. But there are some enhancers where, I mean, in the previous, before your treatment, there's nothing. And, oh. be, and, and after the treatment, there are uh, two, well, bimodal pattern. In that, that case, do you have any score to check that? that? That's okay. Actually, for this algorithm to work, the most important information is these two position nucleosomes. Even here, there's nothing. We can still score it. Uh, we can yeah. still, yeah, we just look at these two locations and we ask what is the count in the, and in the, the other thing the I other would condition. like to ask is, well, you looked at and um, only dimethylation relation for, and can you integrate more histone modification information in this model? Uh, it would just take more money to generate the data, <laughs> <laughs> and we would love to have every kind of histomark. mark. Uh, okay. um, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, let's thank Shirley and all our speakers thank again. Thank you.